At this time, brothers and sisters, I invite you to turn with me to our scripture reading for today as it is found in the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalm 16, Psalm 16. If you are using one of our maroon Bibles, this can be found on page 468, page 468 in our maroon Bibles. While you are turning there, I would also encourage you, please, to keep handy the Heidelberg Catechism Lord's Day that we confessed together a few moments ago. That was Lord's Day 22 on page 881, as we will be using that Lord's Day by way of commentary on the words of our text for today. Psalm 16, I read for us verses 1 through 11. But I draw your special attention, brothers and sisters, to the words of our text, which are verses 8 through 11. Our text will constitute verses 8 through 11. Psalm 16, a miktam of David. Interesting term. I really didn't know what that means, and apparently no one else does either. I saw in my, I saw in my, study, my study Bible footnote, it says miktam. The term, the term remains unexplained though it always stands in the superscription of Davidic prayers occasioned by great danger. And so whatever it means, it is something which David drew on or was mindful of, so to speak, that he needed the help, the deliverance, the salvation of the Lord. And indeed, that is true for each and every one of us as well. Psalm 16, beginning in verse 1, let us hear then the word of the Lord. Keep me safe, my God. For in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Thus far the reading of God's holy word, and as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look to God's word together on this Lord's Day. Dear congregation of Jesus Christ, part of the psalm which we read here just a moment ago, not part of our text, but we read in verse 6, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. By God's grace and to His glory, that is part of my testimony, and I trust it is the testimony of many of you as well. For example, I had the great benefit and blessing of being raised in a Christian home. I had the great benefit and blessing of attending Christian school, K-12, through and also a Christian college. But I think that is part of the reason why, when in God's providence, I began ministering to students in several public high schools in northern New Jersey many years ago through Youth for Christ Campus Life, I was sobered by the realization that many of the high school students to whom I was trying to minister had been well indoctrinated in the satanic lie of evolutionary theory. A satanic lie which taught those many thousands of students that in essence they were simply highly evolved animals. 
and that they were living in a relatively meaningless universe. Think of it. Now, when we consider the lie of evolution, we realize that it flies diametrically opposed to the truth of God's holy word as to who we are and why we are here. In fact, if you would care to turn with me to the book of Genesis, the first chapter, you don't need to turn to our cross-referencing by any means, if that is more edifying to you. But if you would care to turn, in the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, the first chapter, notice what we read in verses 26 and 27. Here God's word declares, Then God said, Genesis 1, 26, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in His own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, notice, two sexes, not 26 sexes, male and female, He created them. Now friends, similarly, if you would care to turn with me, let's go to Psalm 139, Psalm 139. And in verses 13 through 16 of Psalm 39, notice similarly what we read. Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13. The psalmist David declares, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, brothers and sisters, think about that. Young people, think about that. Boys and girls, think about that. My young friends, never allow Satan to seduce you with the lie of evolutionary theory. The Bible says, my young friends, that you were created by God in the image of God for the glory of God. You were created by God in the image of God for the glory of God. And when God made you, no matter who you are, and I'm including the adults in this as well, God made no mistakes. He made us exactly as He wanted us to be for our good and for His eternal glory. Now, why do I share this with you? Well, brothers and sisters, I share this with you by way of indication and illustration of the fact that not only has mankind largely messed up or confused or fallen into false teaching concerning the origins of life, the beginning of life, but mankind has also largely confused and contorted and fallen into false philosophies and and teachings and religions concerning the other end of the age spectrum concerning matters of death and dying. For example, if you scan the, uh, the social political landscape of the world, you'll find that there are many Eastern religions, for example, who posit the position of reincarnation. Reincarnation. This is a philosophy which teaches that once a person dies, they do not cease to exist or or enter into heaven or hell, but that they they are reincarnated. They are are reborn, so to speak, in some other body or form or fashion. A seemingly endless line of existences. Largely dependent, by the way, they say, upon the way you lived your life on earth. And you would come back according to, to the way you lived in some other form or fashion. Now, needless to say, as a confessional reform believer, I, I am uh, vehemently opposed to the uh, doctrine of reincarnation. But I must confess that as I reflect at times and hypothetically, uh, were it true, um, I've had the thought that I'd probably prefer not to come back as Margaret's husband, but as her horse or donkey because of the... <laughs> <laughs> Because of the great amount of TLC uh, bestowed, oh, honey, I'm only kidding. That that you you are you are the best. You are the best, and I hope you'll ride home with me today. Um, nice but <laughs> but reincarnation, antithetical to the sacred scriptures. Now, there's another false philosophy about uh, concerning matters of death and dying, and that would be what is called universalism. 
It's what Dr. R.C. Sproul referred to as justification by death. In other words, all that a person needs to do to be saved is to die. And here, regardless of the fact that whether they had repented of their sins or professed faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, universalism teaches that once a person dies, they are ushered into the holy city, into the very presence of God. Another false doctrine or false philosophy would be those who, who posit the position that we are saved based either to, in totality or in part based upon our good works. Whereas the Bible teaches that it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. And friends, for one final example of these false philosophies concerning matters of death and dying would be what is called annihilationism. Annihilationism. I looked the word up in an evangelical dictionary of theology, and this is what it says concerning annihilationism. Quote, annihilationism is taken from the Latin nihil, meaning nothing, and expresses the position of those who hold that some, if not all, human souls will cease to exist after death. Annihilationism, end of quote. Antithetical to the scriptures. For when you put all these together, we find that John 3.36 states, by way of contrast, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Such false faith and philosophies fly in the face of Hebrews 9.27, which states, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Such false faith and philosophies fly in the face similarly of Revelation 14.11, which speaks of the fact that the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. Think of it. And so on. But oh, my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, in stark and direct contrast to these very dark and deceitful doctrines of demons, as we turn to the sacred scriptures today, and again, I draw your attention specifically to the words of our text in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. Because here we find that the light and the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ shines through. And the message that David has for you and for me today is this. If King David's God is our God, and if King David's profession of faith is our profession of faith, then along with that other, other myriads of blessings, which we will experience for all eternity with King David, is this one that I have turned for our purposes today as the eternal security of body and soul. The eternal security of body and soul. Now then, as we begin to work our way through the words of our text, let us consider first of all the source of, of the eternal security of body and soul. The source of the eternal security of body and soul. Look at verse 8 with me, if you would please. Psalm 16. David says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. Some of the translations say, I have set the Lord always before me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Now, friends, notice here the particular name of God that is used in verse 8. We've learned many times over the, over the years when you see the name Lord in all four capital letters, we need to be thinking that that is a translation of what the uh, theologians call the Tetragrammaton, the unpronounceable four-letter name of God, Y-H-W-H, -H, which we say Yahweh. It refers to the fact that God is the great I Am. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is self-existent. He depends on no one and nothing for His existence. It's the name by which He introduced Himself to Moses at the burning bush, saying, I am a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, etc. But notice that in this psalm, that is not the only name by which David refers to the Lord. Look at verse 1, for example. He says, keep me safe, my God. That's, in the Hebrew, that's the word El. It is short for Elohim, which is the name used in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. If you'll drop down to verse 2, similarly, he says, I say to the Lord, four capital letters, Yahweh, you are my Lord, capital L, small O-R-D. Why? Because that's a translation of the Hebrew name Adonai. And Adonai refers to the fact that God is the, is the boss. He is the Lord. He is the master. He is the controller, the sovereign God over all things. And so, friends, put all of this together. It is this, it is this creator God who rules over all, who has made covenant with his people, 
and compassionately cares for them. He is the God to whom David makes this plea, and he is the God upon whom David places his faith and in whom he places his faith. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. I have set the Lord always before me. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. The great reformer John Calvin puts it this way, and I quote, The meaning, therefore, is that David kept his mind so intently fixed upon the providence of God as to be fully persuaded that whenever any difficulty or distress should befall him, God would be always at hand to assist him. Beautiful. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. My friend, do you do that? Do I do that? <laughs> Keeping our eyes always on the Lord. Always setting the Lord before me. And because of that, can you and I claim, no matter what we're going through in any given day or circumstance, with Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken? Well, my friends, whenever you or I may not be able to say that, or we may not be able to claim that, the fault is not the Lord's. The fault, the deficit is found in you and me. Because at times such as these, my dear, dear friends, we need to cry out to God for greater measure of grace, a greater measure of mercy, a, a greater sense of the presence and power of His Holy Spirit, so that along with David, we might be able to say, I keep my eyes always on the Lord and live each day with the confidence of knowing that because He is at my right hand, you, I, we will not be shaken. And the reason is because the Lord our God and the Lord our God alone is the single source of the eternal security of body and soul. Our text continues. Secondly, let us consider the substance of the eternal security of the body. The substance of the eternal security of the body. That is, practically, personally speaking, what does that mean for you and for me? Look at verse 9 with me, if you would please. David writes, Therefore, now boys and girls, young people, whenever you see a therefore, you need to ask yourself what it is there for. And what this therefore is there for is that because of what David has done and because of the blessed assurance which that for him has won, now he can say, therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Now, you may have a different Bible version. I'm just going to say this real briefly. That says, my glory Put up your hand if that's what your translation says. My glory, re oh, several, okay, glory rejoices. Reason is, it says glory is because in the Hebrew text, that is the word kabod, and kabod means glory. And, 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 it, and it's used in the sense of, of, of very, in the very core of my being, I am rejoicing. The NIV translation and some of the other translations draw on not the Hebrew manuscripts, but the Septuagint manuscripts in the Old Testament. And the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And that uses the word a uh, tongue. And so that's, that's how you end up with some of the different translations, even though the essence of the meaning is the same. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue or my glory rejoices. My tongue or my glory rejoices. Now, friends, notice the connection which David is setting forth there between the feelings of his heart and the resultant words that come from his tongue. The Bible often speaks of the way in which our feelings or affections affect or ought to affect our physical being. In fact, if you're taking notes, for example, jot down, jot down Proverbs 15, verse 13. Proverbs 15, verse 13. Here the Proverbs state, A happy heart makes the face cheerful. A happy heart makes the face cheerful the effect of our emotions on our physical appearance. You know, and because that is true, after, you know, all these years of pastoral ministry, it's often concerned me, uh, not necessarily concerning anyone here today, qual qualifier, but it's concerned me uh, how many Christian worshipers, or just Christians, in worship or the course of a week, always look like they just lost their best friend, or like somebody stole their car, or, or, or something. I mean, you know, sometimes the appearance of us as Christians would not make anyone want to be a Christian. You know, I'm sad enough. I'm depressed enough. I don't need to look like that. OK, and so I think there's a there's a point here that David is making that when his heart is glad, his tongue rejoices. 
His heart was so filled with the peace of God, his tongue could not resist to, but to sound forth with the praise of God. I mean, glory be to God. Glory be to God. And the text continues. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body or my flesh, uh, some of the translations say, also will rest secure. Now, how could he say that my body will rest secure? Well, he goes on to explain that to us. Verse 10. Because you will not abandon me, stay with me, to the realm of the dead. The King James translates that, I believe, I recall, not abandon me to hell. The Hebrew literally reads Sheol, Sheol. And Calvin comments on, on Sheol as follows. He says that Sheol is an insatiable gulf which devours and consumes all things. So whatever your translation says, I think you get the idea. Because you will not abandon me to hell, to the grave, uh, to the realm of the dead, to Sheol, nor will you let your, stay with me again, your faithful one see decay. The translations vary on faithful one. In the Hebrew, where it says in the NIV, faithful one, it is the word uh, chesed. Chesed is the term that's used in, in uh, reference to God's covenantal love and faithfulness. And so you can kind of see how the NIV says faithful one. But I believe the King James Version, check me on this, and I think the New American Standard Version uh, says holy one. Okay, holy one. And it's capitalized. It's capitalized. I believe, and I'm, this is from memory, I think the ESV says holy one, but uses a small H and a small O. If you have an ESV, you can check that. But why does the King James, why does the NAS translate it, nor will you let your Holy One capitalized see decay? Why so? Reason. Reason number one is that David's body did see decay. Margaret and I had the opportunity to travel to Israel several years ago, and we actually were visited David's tomb. They have a, a, a David's tomb is there in Israel. You can, you can see it. His, his body is there. Second reason why many of the translate, translators, and I believe correctly so, translated Holy One capitalized is because of the way in which the apostles Peter and Paul reference this text. For example, if you would care to turn, let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. And in Acts chapter 2, drop down to verse 22 with me if you would please, and I'm going to read through verse 32. Peter says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Notice, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that, the God, knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Similarly, turn over with me if you would care to turn to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Paul is preaching here in a synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. And drop down with me, please, if you're turning. You don't need to. To uh, Acts 13, verse 32. Acts 13, 32, and I'll read through verse 39. Here we read. Paul says, We tell you the good news. What God has promised our ancestors, He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my God. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. 
So it is also stated elsewhere, and this is the words of our text in Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not let your Holy One see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. We are declared not guilty. Boys and girls, young people, God views me just as if I never sinned by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And all glory be to God alone. But friends, think about this. What happened here with the body of Jesus that we've just read about in the scriptures, fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 16, has profound implications very personally, practically, physically for you and me and for your body and my body. For example, if you would care to turn, let's go several pages to the right after the book of Acts to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, the great resurrection passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Drop down with me, please, if you would, to verse 12. Here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul pens this. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 12, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, We are then found to be pseudo-martyros, false witnesses about God, who have testified about God that He raised Him from the dead, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. And if that were the case, we might as well go home right now. But, (laughs) but, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In Old Testament uh, uh, teaching, the first fruits were the first part of the harvest that guaranteed the rest of the harvest would follow. Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Turn over with me also, if you would please, in that same chapter to verse 50. 5-0, verse 50. Paul says, I declared to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In other words, some of us are going to be alive when Christ returns. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, that is why drawing on these and many other passages of Scripture, in Huddleberg Catechism, Lord's Day 22, question and answer 57, article of the Apostles' Creed, the question is asked, how does the resurrection of the body comfort you? And the answer is, not only will my soul be taken immediately after this life to Christ, its head, but also my very flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. All glory be to God. The substance of the eternal security of the body. The substance of the eternal security of the body. Well, friends, let's go back one last time together to Psalm 16. And here we're going to consider thirdly and finally the substance of the eternal security of the soul. The substance, what does that mean personally and practically speaking for you and me? The substance of the eternal security of the soul. Verse 11, uh, look at our text with me if you would please. You make known to me the path of life. Ponder that for just a moment. You, the Lord our God, make known to me, Rich Kukin, Scott, Augie, Carrie, Jen, Ryan, anybody, Jack. 
You make known to me the path of life. You know, as I was prayerfully pondering that part of the text, you know what it said to me? It said to me, there is an intimation of what the Reformed theologians refer to as unconditional election. Unconditional election. You, the Lord God, make known to me, sinner though I am, the path of life. The path of life. It's a glorious doctrine. I was going to have us read, don't turn to it, Romans 9, 10 through 18, where that's spelled out in great detail, eternally, unconditional election. But then I realized we just read that a few, few weeks ago. So instead, I'd like you to turn, if you want to just listen, it's fine. But in the back of the hymnal, turn to page 898. 898, you can just listen if you want. But here we find Canons of Dort. One of the, it sets, the Canons of Dort are a Reformed, doctrine, uh, reformed uh, confession that sets forth the five points of Calvinism, the doctrines of sovereign grace. And on page 898, it's, it's addressing the first head of doctrine, divine election and reprobation. Um, and in Article 7, I'm just going to read the first paragraph. Article 7, it says this, page 898. It sums up so much biblical teaching. Election or choosing is God's unchangeable purpose by which he did the following. Before the foundation of the world, by sheer grace, according to the free good pleasure of his will, he chose in Christ to salvation a definite number of particular people out of the entire human race, which had fallen by its own fault from its original innocence into sin and ruin. Those chosen were neither better nor more deserving of the others, but lay with them in the common misery. He did this in Christ, whom he also appointed from eternity to be the mediator, the head of all those chosen, and the foundation of their salvation. And so he decided to give the chosen ones to Christ to be saved. Jesus references that repeatedly in John 17, his great high priestly prayer and to call and draw them effectively into Christ's fellowship through his word and spirit. In other words, he decided to grant them true faith in Christ, to justify them, to sanctify them, and finally, after powerfully preserving them in the fellowship of his Son, to glorify them. God did all this in order to demonstrate his mercy to the praise of the riches of his glorious grace. And if you drop down to that next paragraph, you see Ephesians 1, you see Romans 8.30, etc. There's so, so much scripture affirms that glorious confession of faith. Let's go back to our text. Let's pick it up again in verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Think about that. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. If you're taking notes, jot down Psalm 4, verse 7, the psalmist David declares in Psalm 4, verse 7, You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. What David is saying is that the world looks to find life. The world looks to find fullness of life. The world looks to find joy in all the things of this life. And as they pursue all of these vices and various sins, they only find themselves as feeling as empty and meaningless and depressed and despairing as before. And that's why in the scriptures in Romans 14, 17, the Apostle Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And in Galatians 5, and 23, Paul writes, For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Illustration. Does the name Dr. Christopher Yuan mean anything to you? Yuan is spelled Y-U-A-N. Dr. Christopher Yuan. Anybody recognize that name? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Three of you do. Lucian's cheating, though, because he was at Synod where this man gave a talk over lunch that I will never forget. You're anyone. I, I know. You count. You count. If you do not know the name, and especially if you have children, and especially if you have teenagers, and I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart in sincerity and truth, write this name down. 
Dr. Christopher Yuan, Y-U-A-N. Chinese man, brother in the Lord, started his talk over lunch with great humor. He said, I was raised by very traditional Chinese parents. They made me obey my parents. They made me excel in school and they made me practice the piano. <laughs> so he had quite a sense of humor. Raised in a Christian home, when he, he left home, he was rejecting everything he had been taught. His father gave him a Bible, right, Lucian? He literally threw it in the garbage. Christopher Wan became one of the biggest drug dealers in Atlanta, Georgia. He immersed himself in the homosexual community and lifestyle. He was a leader among the letter people, the LGBTQ crowd. He was making a fortune selling drugs. He was partying till he had no energy left. And he said, I had everything that the world tells you to pursue. I had sex, I had money, I had power. And he said, I was so miserable, I was contemplating suicide. Christopher Wan, one day, was home in his home, his house, and there was a knock on the door. He opened the door, federal agents, body armor, and he said the two biggest German shepherds he had ever seen in his life. <laughs> and he was raided by the feds. Sentenced to several years in prison. Despairing. He's walking through the cafeteria one day and he sees on the top of a garbage can, didn't know what it was, he picked it up and it was a Gideon Bible. He said, I went back to my cell, I had a lot of time on my hands, he said, and I read it from cover to cover over and over again. And God used that Gideon Bible to convict him of his sin. He, became, he began weeping about what a great sinner he was. And he cried out to God for mercy. And he called home. He said, I didn't think my mother would even take my phone call. Her name was Angela. And he said the first words out of her mouth when she heard it was me were these words, are you okay? He said that unconditional love from my mother broke my heart all over again. And I told her what the Lord was doing in my life. He said, she told me, and moms, listen to this. She told me that every Monday for seven years, she fasted and prayed for the salvation of her son. Subsequent to his release from prison, together mother and son wrote a book called From a Far Off Country, the story of a prodigal son coming home and a mother's love and a mother's prayers. And here's where I want especially the parents to take note. Christopher Wan has become a target of the LGBTQ community because of what he is teaching and what he is preaching. He has formed by God's providence what is called the Holy Sexual Sexuality Project, the Holy Sexuality Project. You can find it at www.holysexuality.com, holysexuality.com, the Holy Sexuality Project. And he says this on this flyer he gave us over lunch. Teenagers are facing a tsunami of misinformation from the world when it comes to sexuality and gender. Yet God has ordained parents to diligently teach his ways to their children, Deuteronomy 6-7. Dr. Christopher Wan and his team produced the Holy Sexuality Project video series, a 12-lesson home discipleship resource for parents and grandparents to teach their teens. Margaret and I are grievously becoming more and more aware of some young people that we've known over the years, many of whom we've ministered to, are falling for the lie, the satanic, diabolical lies of the LGBTQ community. Our children are not exempt from Satan's seductions. And so pray for Dr. Christopher Juan. Maybe check out his website, The Holy Sexuality Project. Pray that the Lord would be merciful even and especially in our churches to protect our children that are falling prey to these demonic lies. It is only in Christ. You make known to me the path of life. 
You will fill me with joy in your presence. With eternal pleasures. The NAS says forever. Pleasures forever. The King James says pleasures forevermore. Not fleeting, not temporary, not transitory. You fill me with joy in your presence. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. That is why Heidelberg Catechism question and answer 58 comforts us this way. How does the article concerning life everlasting comfort you? Answer. Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life I will have perfect blessedness such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has ever imagined a blessedness in which to praise God eternally. My dear, dear friend, if when we read that a few moments ago together, you cannot say that in sincerity and truth. If Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior as you sit here and worship today, I ask and urge you, I pray, I plead with you, ask God for the grace before you leave this place to repent of your sins and to profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because then, no matter what may befall us of good or ill on any given day, we, would, we will be able to rest and rejoice in the fact that my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices in the blessed assurance of the eternal security of our body and our soul. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer together. <clears throat> I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I shall not be moved. O oh, faithful Father, how we thank and praise You today that this precious promise is true for body and soul, in time, and for all eternity. Consequently, Lord, enable and empower each and every one of us, we pray, today and every day, to be able to rest and rejoice in the eternal security of body and soul. By your grace alone, through faith in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ alone, do we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.